Well, good morning, church. How are we doing? Awesome. I'm really excited to be here with you guys this Sunday. Hey, if you're new with us, my name is Justin. I get the privilege of being the directional lead pastor here. And listen, it is one of the great joys of my life to get to worship shoulder to shoulder with all of you as we follow Jesus together. Hey, we are coming off of Missions Week. So we had Mission Sunday last Sunday, and all throughout the week we had different mission partners in our church coming and sharing about the ways that God is moving. You might not have known this, but last Sunday, while we were in here at Mission Sunday, over in Kids Life, they were talking about God's heart for the world, just like we were talking about God's heart for the world here. And in fact, they were learning about God's heart for the world through Luke and Caleb. Luke and Caleb are two of our mission partners who are serving over in Cote d'Ivoire, West Africa right now. But last year, this time, they were serving as Kids Life leaders over in Kids Life. So how cool is this? Our kids were learning about God's heart for the world through people that they knew last year as Kids Life leaders who are now mission partners halfway across the world. Friends, God is moving, listen, all over the planet through this church here in southwest Missouri. It's just a joy of my life to get to sit front row and watch him move. Amen? Amen. Hey, this morning uh, we are going to be hopping back into our Roman series. So if you happen to have your Bibles, go ahead and pull those out. We're going to be in Romans 7. Before we get there, though, I do have a couple of things for you guys. You already heard them talk about this, but I I really can't help myself. The first one is a big one. We worship a Savior who lived perfectly. He lived a life of perfection, righteousness, and obedience, the life that we should have lived. He died sacrificially on a Roman cross to wash away the stain of our sin and to wash away the stain of our shame. He washed us white as snow in his blood. But the disciples would have surely felt defeated as they were pulling Jesus down from the cross and putting him in Joseph's tomb. Our God can't be contained by a tomb, though. Amen? We worship a living Savior. He walked out of the tomb in triumph three days later, defeating Satan's sin and death. It was all for his glory, which means that this Easter, guess what we're going to do? We're going to celebrate. We're going to celebrate a risen Savior. We're going to celebrate the fact that he moved from death to life, which means that if you're a follower of Jesus, we can know he moved our dead hearts and he made them alive, which is the best news in the history of the universe, as you already heard DMAL talk about. So this Easter weekend, we're going to do several things. We're going to have two Good Friday services on Good Friday. They're going to be awesome. Our Good Friday services, church, are some of my favorite things that we do as a church. We get to pause right at the beginning of a busy Easter weekend And we get to reflect on, think about, and even meditate upon the significance of the fact that we worship a Savior who walked to a Roman cross and died in our place. It's 5 and 6.30. We'll get to take communion together. I'd love to invite you to join me there. Then on Easter Sunday, we'll have a sunrise service, 6.30 a.m., out at Fellowship uh, Farms Pavilion, um, weather permitting. And then we'll have four identical Easter services, 8, 9.30, 11, and 12.30. If you can, we would ask that you wake your family up early. Get the clip-on tie on on your son and and come on out for our 8 a.m. service and we'll be done. And then you get to go and and, uh, have brunch before all the other Easter crowd gets there. Have your Easter egg hunt, those kind of things. Or here's an idea. Maybe you sleep in. Have a nice, easy, lazy Easter Sunday morning. You have your brunch together and then you join us at our 1230 service and you have your Easter egg hunt right after that. But whatever service you come to, we would ask as you leave to grab some of our invite cards And invite everybody you can. We're making space in here for as many people as are willing to join us on our Easter services. And we'd love for your whole neighborhood, your family, your friends, co-workers to join us there. Then, you you heard Drake talk about this. Two weeks after Easter, we're having a men's conference. Men, this is for you and it's for your buddies. It is going to be a ton of fun to gather the men in our church and really from churches all over our community together and to hear about biblical masculinity from Jonathan Dotson. He's going to do an incredible job on that. But what I'm most excited about is we're going to have fun together. We're going to feed you dinner on Friday night. We'll play cornhole, or as my wife's family calls it, bags. We'll play that. It'll be great. Uh, In in the actual uh, uh, stuff that we're doing that night, uh, don't tell the elders, but we're going to be able to hit some practice golf balls at that little window in the back of the room and and see what happens there. I'm sure nothing will break. Um, It'll be fine. Most of all, we'll get to worship Jesus together. And it's going to be a lot of fun. So uh, let me encourage you to go ahead and get signed up for the men's conference. And do it quickly because so, our, our stuff is filling up, especially some of our breakout sessions. They're, they're getting filled up. I'd love to encourage you to, to get signed up uh, today. All right. For the last several weeks in our Roman series, Paul has been laying before us a revolutionary life-transforming, heart-freeing strategy for defeating the heart-level sins in our life. 
You see, we need to fight our sin, according to the Apostle Paul, from the inside out. We fight our sin with our new identity in Christ. Christian, did you know that right now, because of what Jesus has already done, like right now, right now, here's your identity. You're dead to sin. Christ is with you. You're free from your sin, and your eternity is secured. Nothing and no one can take that identity from you. So Paul says in Romans 6, hey, we take that identity, and we let it work its way out into our actual day-to-day lives. We live in light of who we already are in Christ. But that's not all. At the end of Romans 6, Paul says, hey, we also need to fight our sin from the outside in. Like, did you know that every act in your life is an act of submission to some master? Paul says at the end of Romans 6, everything we do is an act of submission to some master. The choice is not freedom versus submission. The choice is submission to bad masters who lead to death versus submission to a good master named Jesus who leads to life. So what do we do? Well, we submit every area of our life to him, and he leads us to real life. And then at the beginning of Romans 7, we saw that we need to live in the relational presence of God rather than in religious performance. You see, religious performance says, I do in order to earn. I do religious things in order to earn the blessing and favor of the Lord. That's not Christianity. Christianity says, I do because I loved the one who loved me first. He loved me first, and I respond by loving him in return. And if we need help in all of that, God has given us his Holy Spirit, who points us to the gospel over and over again, who empowers us to live as God has called us to live, and maybe most precious of all, who is God's relational presence with us, always and everywhere. Now, all of that sounds great. Tie a bow on it. A nice buttoned up ethical system. You do this and life is smooth sailing until you get to go to heaven with Jesus. Has that been your experience? It's not been mine. It's not how your walk with the Lord has gone. You see, Romans 6 and Romans 7 sound great until real life hits, don't they? Like real life leads us to ask some really hard questions. Like, okay, Paul, what happens when sin persists? Like Romans 6 and 7 sound great, but what happens when the fear and the anxiety won't go away? What what happens, Paul, when the joylessness and the despair won't lift? Or, hey, Romans 6 and 7 sound great, but what happens when I'm still stuck? Like it's been years, and I'm still stuck in this crippling comparison and envy stuff. Like just almost every single day, what happens then? It's been years, and I and I'm still can't forgive that person, and the bitterness has seeped into every area of my life. Paul, what happens then? Or, what happens when I know the right thing to do, and I still do dumb stuff anyways? Like, what happens when I know it's dumb to flirt with the girl who's not my spouse in my office, but I do it anyways? What, what happens when I know it leads nowhere good to click on that link and go to that website, but there I am, late at night, at the website again? What happens, maybe scariest of all, when this thing called Christianity is harder than I ever thought at first? What happens when I begin to wonder if I'm even a Christian? Did you know you're allowed to ask questions like that in church? Like This is a safe place. We don't need to pretend that we have it all together. Do you know why it's okay to ask questions like that in church? Because Paul asks questions like that in Romans 7. This week, in one of the most surprisingly comforting chapters in the Bible, we're going to watch the Apostle Paul, it seems like in real time, process the reality that he's an apostle. He has had a face-to-face encounter with Jesus himself, and sin still persists in his life. See, church, we, Fellowship Bible Church, are a perfect place for imperfect people. Because from cover to cover in your Bible, what you find is a whole bunch of imperfect people clinging to one perfect person named Jesus who can help them. Let me show you what I mean. I'm going to pray, and then we're going to jump into Romans 7. Pray with me. Jesus, I pray that you'd meet us in this place. I pray that there would be real gospel encounters this morning. God, that we would feel the goodness of the good news of your grace in fresh ways. And the pathway might feel strange. We're going to talk about sin. But God, I pray that as we walk through that discussion of the reality of sin in our lives, we would see that your grace is, in fact, more amazing than we thought when we walked in the door here. 
Jesus, thank you for what you've done for us. Thank you for speaking to us. God, I ask that you'd use my imperfect words to point your people to your perfect truth, all for your glory. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, there are seasons of life as a follower of Jesus. Can we just be real about this? Where it's just kind of obvious that following the Lord is better. Like there are are good, really good seasons. Like the longer I follow Jesus, the more convinced I become that Christianity isn't just true, it's better. Like it's the best way to do life. Many of you know that uh, Kate's father passed away earlier this spring. And and I got to do the funeral. And so I got to talk about how he he lived his life focused on his faith and focused on his family. But most of all, I got to talk about the glory of where he is right now. After a five-year battle with, with Alzheimer's, his thoughts are clear. He remembers his family, and he's worshiping in the presence of the Savior that he loved. Now, I don't know how you can handle the reality of death apart from the hope of the gospel. Christianity isn't just true, it's good. It's the best way to do life, and that becomes maybe most obvious of all at the end of life. But that's not the only kind of season you'll encounter as a Christian. See, there are also seasons of life as a follower of Jesus where following the Lord is hard, but his glory peaks through the clouds from time to time. Like, have you ever been in a season of suffering? Like, if you ever walked through suffering, you know that this is true. You would never call that season good. But there are moments in the midst of seasons of suffering where the glory of the Lord peeks through the clouds. And that glory is more glorious because of the darkness of the pain that you're walking through in your season of suffering. There are moments where the closeness of the Lord feels closer because of the difficulty of the season that you're walking through. We're actually going to get to hear a story about all of that a little bit later when we get an update from from Ryan and Lauren uh, about Brooks and their transition back here. But neither of those two types of seasons is what Paul is going to talk about here in Romans 7. Neither of those two types of seasons is what Paul's going to talk about. Because if you follow Jesus for any season of time, and especially if you follow Jesus for decades, you know there's a third type of season. There's, this, there's types of seasons as a follower of Jesus where you have no clue what to do. Where it's hard to figure out what's up and what's down. You're just kind of trying, to, trying to, to, to float along and hope that you come out on the other side at some point. Seasons like when the sin persists. Or when you find yourself running back to that thing you thought you had already defeated. Or when you begin to go into one of those deep, dark seasons of doubt. What do you do then? What do you do when the growth is stalled? What do you do when you find yourself descending into hopelessness or despair? In Romans 7, Paul is going to give us one thing not to do and two things to do. Read about it with me. Romans 7. And as you're reading this, here's here's what I want you to realize. This is the Apostle Paul. It's maybe the Apostle Paul at his rawest. Like he's given us like stuff that he's really wrestling with in the face of his sin. So listen to this. Romans 7, starting in verse 7. Paul writes this. What then shall we say? That the law is sin? By no means. Yet if it had not been for the law, I would not have known sin. For I would not have known what it is to covet if the law had not said, you shall not covet. That's the 10th commandment, by the way. But sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, produced in me all kinds of covetousness. For apart from the law, sin lies dead. I once was alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin came alive and I died. The very commandment that promised life proved death to me for sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, deceived me, and through it killed me. So the law is holy, and the commandment is holy and righteous and good. Did that which is good then bring death to me by no means? This is where Paul gets really real with us. It was sin producing death in me through what is good, in order that sin might be shown to be sin, through the com- though the, through the commandment might become more sinful beyond measure. For we know that the law is spiritual. But I'm of the flesh, sold under sin. For I do not understand my own actions. I do not do what I want to do, but the very thing, I do the very thing I hate. Now if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law that it's good. So now it's no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me that's in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. Listen to this. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want, it's no longer I who do it, but the sin that dwells in me. So I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. 
For I delight in the law of God in my inner being, but I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Let me just pause right here. You should feel strangely comforted. You want to know why? Because the Apostle Paul is saying the things that you struggle with, he struggles with too. Am I the only one who feels this? Paul is saying, hey, listen, man, some of the stuff that I'm walking through is real stuff, and I, I can't feel like I can get to the other side of it. I don't know how. I'm stuck. If you've ever been stuck, the Apostle Paul is saying, yeah, me too. Now listen to this, verse 24. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? If you've never been there, it's a hard place to be. But listen to the hope. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh I serve the law of sin. Paul, in these verses, has given us one thing not to do in the face of the ongoing reality of our sin, and then two things to do. One thing not to do, blame God's word. We should not blame God's word in the face of the reality of our sin. You see, when sin persists, you will begin to be tempted to believe a whole bunch of lies. You'll begin to believe, or tempted to believe at least, that, that God and his word are ultimately the issue. Like, listen, here's the problem, Justin. God's rules... That they're too outdated to work today in the 21st century world. Or, listen, God, Justin, God doesn't care about me. My stuff is too much for him. He's just kind of abandoned me to deal with it on my own, and I can't really figure it out. Or, maybe scariest of all, you'll begin to believe the lie following God isn't better. Like, I sh somebody pulled the wool over my eyes. I should have just, like, uh, done what all my buddies are doing. They seem to be having more fun than I am. I'm just here and, and miserable. You'll be tempted to believe that the issue is God and his word. And Paul says, hey, that's a lie. You'll be tempted to blame God and his word. And Paul says, hey, don't do that. The issue is not God and his word. The issue in the face of our ongoing presence of sin is us. Look down at verses 7 to 12 if you have your Bibles here. These are complicated verses, but let me try to give you the logic of what Paul is saying here. Before Christ, there are a whole host of things that were sinful. We just didn't care about whether or not they were sinful. Like, for example, before Christ, you probably didn't know that lusting was a sin. And even if you did, you didn't care. We didn't know before Christ that gossip was a sin, but and even if we did, we didn't care or we didn't know that envy was a sin, and even if we did, we, we didn't care about that either. This is what I think Paul is saying when he says that sin lies dead in his heart before Christ. It's not that we weren't sinning, it's that we don't care about it. Then, if you're a follower of Jesus, at some point, you became a Christian. And you open up God's word, and you read the law. You find out that a whole host of things in our life fall short of God's standard for us, and therefore are sinful. You become aware of sin. And then you specifically become aware that your sin goes way deeper than you think, and it feels like a sort of death. Like it's the death of your prideful assumption that you're good to go. It's the death of your prideful assumption that you're righteous and holy on your own. So listen, Christian, what happened then? You become aware of your sin, and so surely you stop sinning, don't you? Paul says that doesn't happen either. The ongoing presence of sin in our lives mean that we become aware of sin, and that sin entices us like sin is inherently deceiving so our sinful hearts hear about sin and just like eve we're tempted to believe that god's holding out to on us and that sin might be good and so we walk down that road even more so question in this scenario who's to blame is it god in his word no paul says we in our sin are the ones to blame paul uses covetousness as an example now, I imagine that as you were driving into this church service, you and your spouse or you and your buddies were talking about coveting. But if you weren't, let me just define what coveting is, and then we'll talk about it. Coveting is an over-desire for someone else's stuff. It's an over-desire for someone else's things. And before Christ, we certainly covet. We just live blissfully unaware that coveting is a sin. And even if we know it's a sin, we don't care. Of course, we covet that person's job. He's got a cool job. Or his house, got an awesome house. Or his quarter zips, or his vest, and maybe this is just me. You covet that person's physique. That's just what people do. Even a lot of times, we fuel our hard work with coveting. Like, listen, I'm going to work hard so that I can get what that guy's got. Then you become a Christian. And you become aware that coveting is a sin. Now, simply knowing that coveting is a sin does not mean we stop coveting. In fact, 
it might mean that we become more aware that the, our coveting was more pervasive than we thought at first. Or in fact, it might mean that as soon as we find out that coveting is a sin, we're tempted to covet more, not less. Do you see how this works? It leads us to believe lies. Like, God's word can't be good. It's too hard. It makes me feel bad. The biblical word for that is conviction. It just doesn't work. And Paul says the issue is not God and his word. It's us. We're sinful. Why does habitual sin persist? Why do we run back to that old sin that we thought we defeated? Well, the issue, the problem is not with God and his word. The problem is with us, which leads to the next thing that Paul says. When we're stuck, hopeless, and despairing in our sin, here's one thing to do. We shouldn't blame God and his word. Here's one thing to do. We should be honest about the depth of our sin. Read verses uh, 14 to 19 with me one more time. Listen to what Paul says. Let me ask you some questions. Paul says, For we know that the law is spiritual, but I'm of the flesh, sold under sin. For I do not understand my own actions. For I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing that I hate. Have you ever been there? Now, if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law that it's good. So now it's no longer I who do it, but the sin that dwells within me. For I know nothing that, I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. Have you ever been there? For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Have you ever been there? Do you see what Paul's doing? He's talking about the tension in the life of a believer, somebody who's following Jesus but aware of the ongoing presence of sin in his life. He's giving us an honest picture of the reality of sin in the life of those who are followers of Jesus. And specifically this morning, I think Paul wants us to know three things about our sin. Here's the reality for the Apostle Paul, every other Christian on the planet, and every Christian in this room when it comes to our sin. First, Christ has won the war. That's what the first six chapters of Romans are about. Jesus has done all that is necessary to defeat our greatest enemies of Satan, sin, and death. When Jesus said, it is finished from the cross, church, do you know what that means in the original Greek? It means, it is finished. The penalty of your sin, finished. The stain of your shame, finished. The just wrath of God toward all of your sins, past, present, and future, that's finished too. And because it is finished in Christ, our salvation has been secured. Justification, secured. Redemption and reconciliation, secured. Sanctification, this this ongoing process over the course of your life here on this planet of growing to be more and more like Jesus, that's secured too. Eternal glory, secured. So one thing you need to know about your sin, Christ has won the war with it. It's already won. Second thing you need to know, this is what Paul is talking about in Romans 7. Over the course of a lifetime, God the Holy Spirit will progressively over time reveal more and more of the reality of just how deep your sin goes. The way I like to think about it is God the Holy Spirit over time reveals these little pockets of rebellion in our heart. These little rebel sin camps that live in our heart and then he empowers us over time to subdue those places of rebellion. Now, it doesn't happen all at once. Do you want to know why? Because God knows that if he revealed all of the places where we're rebelling against him right now, it would just overwhelm us and paralyze us. But over time, he reveals things. Like, hey, listen, that anger thing, it's an issue. So you begin to deal with it in his power. And then as you're kind of beginning to find freedom there, he he shows you, oh, wait, that envy thing, that's an issue too. So you begin to find freedom there. And then, oh, that unforgiveness and bitterness, that's an issue too. And so you deal, he empowers us with the gospel to find freedom. Third thing, this process happens over and over and over again until glory. All throughout your life as a follower of Jesus, you're going to be finding new places of rebellion in your heart or old places that resurface. And God, the Holy Spirit, is going to give you power through the gospel to bring those places of rebellion in submission to your Savior. It's kind of like... Hiro Onoda. This is a picture of Hiro Onoda. He's a famous Japanese soldier. Onoda is famous because he lived in the Philippine jungle and he continued fighting in World War II until 1974 when he finally surrendered to the Philippine government. So think about this. For 29 years, from 1945 until 1974, Onoda was fighting a battle in a war that had already been won. That's what your sin's doing right now. It's fighting battles. 
And you're fighting back if you're a follower of Jesus. Sometimes well, sometimes you feel like you're losing those battles. But they're all battles in a war that's already been won by your Savior. So feel how powerful this is. Why does Paul and why do we do what we do not want to do? Why are we tempted by the evil that we hate? Why, why do we have the desire to do what's right, but we, then we don't carry it out? Well, because Christ has won the war, and we're still in the process of subduing the rebel camps of sin in our hearts. Both those things are true of every Christian in this room. Listen, this is the normal Christian life. Follow me. If that's true, if what Paul is saying in Romans 7 is true, for every Christian in this room, do you know what it means? You might as well be honest. You might as well stop hiding. And when you are honest, and when you do stop hiding, you'll be met with a community in this church that says, oh yeah, me too. I, I might not have the same sin that you do, but I'm stuck somewhere too. I might not have the same struggle that you have, but I'm tempted to despair somewhere too. Do you feel how freeing this is? Second thing. When we're stuck, hopeless, and despairing in our sin, here's a second thing to do. Cast yourself on the grace of Christ again and again and again. Do you feel how hopeless Paul was in verse 24? It's kind of the climax of Paul being hopeless in his sin. Listen to what he says. Verse 24, chapter 7. Paul says this. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Where's the hope in that verse? Well, the hope comes in verse 25. Got to keep reading. Look at the beginning of verse 25. But thanks be to God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. There's only one hope in the light of the ongoing presence of sin in our lives. God the Father sent Jesus the Son. Jesus, who is God, added humanity to his divinity, and he came on a rescue mission for us. He lived a perfect life. He walked step by step to Jerusalem. On Palm Sunday, this Sunday, 2,000 years ago, he walked into Jerusalem and there were crowds cheering around him because they thought he was walking into Jerusalem to secure himself a crown. They did not know yet that he came to endure a cross. Jesus came to be our Christ. That word Christ in verse 25, it's not a name. It's a title. It means Messiah. Savior, Jesus came to die on a Roman cross to endure all of the wrath of God for all of our sins, past, present, and future. He came to save sinners like Paul. He came to save sinners like me. And he came to save sinners like you as well. Which means every time you do the evil that you do not want to do. Every time you run back to that old sin that you thought you defeated, but you're back in that place again. Every time you walk through a season of feeling stuck, Jesus already died for that. He's our Christ, and Jesus came to be our Lord as well. He didn't leave us to our own devices. He rose from the dead in victory over Satan's sin and death. He is a living Savior, which means he is with us every moment of every day. He's with you, Christian, through his Holy Spirit. See, our one hope in the face of the reality of our sin, our one hope when we're stuck and we run back to that thing again, our one hope when it feels like we're going nowhere fast and you're being tempted to give it all up. Our one hope is not a legal code. It's not a worship experience and it's not a religious activity. Our one hope is a person. His name is Jesus. And his grace, friends, is the only thing powerful enough to get us unstuck where we're stuck. His love is the only thing powerful enough to keep us from despairing when we're tempted to despair. And his presence and his spirit will be the only thing that will keep us from running back to that old sin again. And they're the only thing that are powerful enough to make our hearts believe in God's mercy and forgiveness when we find ourselves in that old place of sin again. You see, when our hearts cry out, wretched man that I am, wretched woman that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? God, through his word and through his people, preaches to our hearts. But thanks be to God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. It is the best news in the history of the universe. Amen? Now, if that's true, what do you do? Because brass tacks, most of us have places where we're stuck right now. What do you do in places where you're ashamed that you've run back to that thing again? Two things. You confess rather than hide. And you remember rather than perform. You confess your sin again and again. Listen, there's no hiding in real Christianity. Do you know why? Because there's no expectation of perfection in real Christianity. 
you are going to fight sin for the rest of your life. So you might as well bring it into the light. Some of us this morning, can I just be real with you guys? You need to bring that place with your stu- where you're stuck, you need to bring it before the Lord. And he already knows it. It's not like you're like, surprised. About, oh, I didn't know you were struggling with that. No, he knows. But there's something powerful about bringing it out and saying, God, I know you know about this. I know about it too. Won't you help me? And you remember the grace of Jesus Christ, your Savior and Lord. You, you don't perform your way out of your stuckness. You run to your Savior. And the joy of his grace brings freedom. This is why we worship after the sermon every single Sunday. Most Sundays you come here, God's word is going to challenge you in something. Or you're going to be aware of the ongoing reality of your sin, and and it will feel convicting. But then after that conviction, every single Sunday, we stand and we remind ourselves of the goodness of God's grace for us. The grace of Jesus is with us even in the face of places where we're stuck, hopeless, and despairing. And we do all of it in a community of fellow strugglers. Church, my prayer is that this would be a place where it's safe to process and be honest. Doesn't mean there are no consequences to sin, but it does mean that in this church, when somebody brings their sin into the light, here's what what they won't say in response. They won't say, ooh, can't believe you struggle with that. No, no, no. We are a church of people who say, man, I'm so sorry. I've been there too. And then we remind ourselves together of the grace of our Savior over and over again because our sin is great, but Jesus' grace is greater. Do you see the hope of the gospel in the face of the real life reality of our sin? Paul is going to spend all of Romans 8 unpacking the glorious of the gospel for us as followers of Jesus who struggle. We're going to spend six weeks as a church walking through Romans 8. It's my favorite chapter in the Bible. We're going to start next week on Easter Sunday, and I'm convinced it'll change your life. But before we can get there, we have to get here. Fellowship Bible Church is an imperfect place for perfect people. Good thing there are no perfect people. We are a perfect place for imperfect people. See, if you're willing to say with the Apostle Paul and with Justin Stringer and with a couple hundred of your friends that you struggle and that sin is real and it's hard sometimes, this church is a perfect place for you. Do you know why this is a perfect place for imperfect people? Because this is a safe place to be honest about your sin, to bring it into the light, even today. And it's a safe place to be reminded about Jesus. We're going to do both of those things this morning. I want to give you space this morning to come before the Lord and say, God, I know you know about this thing. It's real. It's there. I'm bringing it before you. I need your help. And then I want us to be a safe place to remind ourselves of just how amazing God's grace is for us. Let me pray. Jesus, we love you. And God, this may not have been the message that we were hoping to hear when we walked into this this building today, but it's the message we needed to hear. So thank you for speaking it to us. God, we need fresh awareness of just how amazing your grace is for us. Help us to feel it. Help us to know it. God, I pray that we'd be honest about places where we're stuck. We don't need to hide that stuff anymore. We'd be honest with you. We'd be honest with our community. God, I pray also that we would be honest about just how amazing your grace is for us. It shines all the more gloriously because of just how difficult it is sometimes to find freedom from the sin that we're stuck in. You paid for it, and that's amazing news for us. We love you, Jesus. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.